and let uh, Al take it away. General disclosure, all bookmap limited materials, information, and presentations are for educational purposes only and should not be considered specific investment advice nor recommendations. Risk disclosure, trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Uh, now, uh, why we uh, put this whole uh, institutional trader uh, a webinar series together. Uh, it was kind of by chance uh, that uh, we we're having a competition that came first, uh, and then we decided that uh, we're going to give uh, people uh, more money than normal. We'll give a million dollars in SIM. It starts October 29th, uh, so on Tuesday. Uh, sign up. Uh, here's the competition uh, link, uh, competition.bookmap.com. Uh, in fact, uh, we're going to have uh, webinars all week long during the competition next week, uh, giving some coaching, et cetera, uh, and uh, lots of prizes and, and other things. So uh, we are learning from uh, traders like Al uh, and uh, how they traded size uh, and um, from their institutional backgrounds, which will help us uh, in the competition. Uh, so that that is the goal here. Uh, and uh, just a few other news events to keep you guys uh, in the loop here. Uh, our beta programs, uh, reach out at beta at bookmap.com. Uh, we have a new multi-account add-on. So if you're trading like fast track trading or, or some other uh, prop firm, uh, you can uh, take one trade but uh, send them to multiple accounts. Uh, we also have a market pulse uh, new Market Pulse web tool with the heat map, uh, and uh, and there are many others. Uh, we also have our ongoing Blue Jacket competition, uh, which started October uh, 10th. So if you want to join uh, that, you can come over to our Discord channel, uh, as well as our uh, come to our Bookmap Academy meetings. We just had one last night, uh, which was great. Uh, we give coaching and mentoring uh, to the Academy members. All right, so. Uh, today, uh, Al Bingemore, hedge fund manager, uh, and I'll let Al take it away from here. Hey guys, uh, thank you very much for the intro boost. Before I start, there are several people that are trying to get in. For some reason, this channel seems to be locked. I just thought I should tell you. Uh, for like instance, there's a guy called Max Maximus that's trying to get in, and he's not able to get in. I just thought I should tell you, tell you gentlemen that. But huh. uh, again, thank you, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, I basically consider myself an old user of uh, book, Bookmap. Um, I got introduced to it by a friend of mine back in 2017. So this presentation has been a long time coming. Um, prior times when Bruce or Sahi reached out saying, hey, I think you should talk. Uh, I was not able to do that because I was actively running a hedge fund. Right? Anyway, so now I have an AI you know, company called Trade Inside AI. I'm not going to talk about that very much, but more concentrate on uh, domain knowledge that you really need to be able to, to utilize bookmap to its maximum capability. That's the goal, goal of this whole thing. And to make you sort of see things more in a sort of a systematic bent because I'm a quantitative trader. Um, anyway, so that, so that said, my uh, background really, really quickly, I started managing money for Steve Cohen. I'm sure you guys know who that is uh, for SAC Capital, when I was still in college, as a senior, I had a quantitative news newsletter called NeuroQuant Profiles. This was in 92, 93 ish. Uh, SAC at that time was running about 85 million. I was given 10 million to run as a college senior. So I did that. He liked what he saw. And I, and I basically moved to New York uh, and I was given close to 20 million to run, by which time the fund was running about 110 odd million, so 20% of the firm's money. And I eventually ended up building a large group at SAC Capital. It was the second largest book. Uh, I was the first global statistical uh, arbitrage quant at SAC Capital. Um, I was there from 93 to 2004 for the life. I think we generated about 740 odd million in profits for the firm. Uh, and our group was certainly one of the pioneers in electronic trading. Uh, we used to account for maybe three quarter of a percent to a percent and a quarter to probably once a week on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so my background is in computer science and machine you know, learning. Uh, I wrote my first neural net in 93, 92, 93 ish. And since then, since about, two, since about 2004, I've been on my own. And in 
14 or so, I was co-CIO of Turner Capital Partners. And right after COVID, like many people, I got sick and I decided to leave. And now I have, now I have this new AI you know, uh, com- company where we're trying to distill complex data for in- inference with a special focus on financial markets. That's my background. Um, so basically, what, Bruce, the next slide over. So what we're going to talk about is I sort of stress the importance of having domain knowledge and trying to think about markets in more human terms. Markets today are far from what humans think they are, right? Because they're operating at a completely different time scale. So we're, so we're going to talk about the tick of markets or the heartbeats of markets. What is a sig- signal in the modern day that's today? And then we're going to go delve into MBO data. I'm sure every one of you that have used Bookmap have heard about what MBO data is. Then we're going to talk about everybody's favorite MBO event, which is a stock run event, right? So, um, and I'll actually tell you some things about that. And then we'll see how you can actually use book, Bookmap. And then we'll put book, Bookmap into which software paradigm it is in. And why you as a human are doing exactly what a machine is trying to do, in a sense. And then we'll actually, you know, open up the field. I'll actually tell you some war stories I've had um, and how large PMs, and when I say large, you know, PMs back, you know, back back in the day, uh, so the fund that I, or or the book that I managed within SAC Capital was about 1.2 billion. It was the second largest book at SAC Capital. So the way that you sort of transact there is inherently linked to what your your holding period of sorts is, where you're not trying to put a major part of your egg into one or two single positions. However, at times I did actually do that, and I have some wounds that I'll actually talk to you about. And then finally, we'll actually come to how you could really leverage books map, uh, Bookmap's ability to look into uh, what are modern markets and place that within a human, uh, human-centered human uh, structural view, contextual view of the market to do a trade. And then I'm open to any sort of questions you may have, right? So I'll just sort of go through go through this really, really quickly and we can actually get the needed, needed like a bit. Next slide, Bruce. So the most the most critical thing is what actually dictates financial markets today is this concept of time. So I just want to I just want to impress upon you the fact that the heartbeat of the market, the true heartbeat of the market, uh, cannot be sensed by us humans because things are happening within one second, right? Uh, things are actually happening in nanoseconds. In fact, the MBO data feed that you get is in nanoseconds, and it's essentially a packet stream. And I'm specifically talking, let's say, about the Chicago Mercantile Exchange market, the market data feed, right? And time is so central here. So just to sort of give you an idea, like a modern you know, computer is able to process billions of transactions per second, right? The blink of your of your eyelid is somewhere around 300 to 450 milliseconds. Now, within this MBO fee that Bookmap gets, in one second, there are billion data points where a trade can actually happen, right? So as you kind of know, uh, as I hope you know, um, trades don't, ha- uh, don't happen on a regular basis. You might, you might have something happen in the 250 nanosecond and the you know, uh, 500,000 nanoseconds and then something else, right? So it's, it, it's a non-equally time-spaced thing that's going on. But we as humans like to sort of view it in our world as more like, okay, this actually happened in some second or some minute or some hour and so on and so forth. So I just want you to think, right? If you look at the things that are going on inside the market, we can actually visualize a minute, we can visualize a sec- second, and then after that, for us humans, all bets are off because we cannot think in 
milliseconds, microseconds, or nanoseconds. So I just want you to please remember this. Keep this at the back of your head. It's, it's one of the most critical things now, and we'll actually get to it why later, right? Okay, so um, next slide, Bruce. Okay, so we're actually gonna get to what a signal is, right? So a signal basically is any kind of pattern of data that triggers you or an algo to buy, sell, or modify any kind of order you may have, right? Uh, it does not matter how you actually come to whatever, you know, makes, makes you buy, sell, or cancel, but that's what a signal is. So, you know, I would like to tell you back in, in, the, in the mid 90s, um, and I, and I know certainly in, in this group, uh, Tom is here, and today instantly happens to be his birthday, so happy birthday, Tom. Um, you know, you, you had things, you had mispricings of sorts, or you had some kind of edge that persisted for days on end, right? But the more communication systems got quicker, that time in which you could act and in which you could benefit from that, poten that potential alpha, uh, started to de decrease in time, right? So in about 2000, 2008, um, provided you had a high frequency data feed, you would, you would see like a signal last anywhere between two to six seconds, two to eight seconds or so in which you could act on a large enough scale, let's say, right? And fast forward to 2015, that's kind of gone down to 10 to 15 microseconds. And I, and I truly don't know what that signal number is today, right? So the actual point is markets are kind of giving you, and when I say markets are giving you, I'm actually talking about markets as measured in a very high frequency scale, right? I'm not talking about signals that may, that may come from some, your reading of a balance sheet of a number, nothing of that sort if you're trading stocks, right? This from a high frequency point of view. So the, Duration of signals has really gone down a lot, right? So can you go to the next slide, Bruce? So it, 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 it's readily apparent of what those things look like when you really look at MBO data and what MBO stands for, literally market by order data. It's a packet data feed where you're literally getting a dump of everything that your central limit order book shows you, and I'm talking, let's say, about the Chicago Mercury Exchange. It's giving you a, a dump of everything, every single me message that is going through the central limit order book at the CME to match any orders that you may, that you may have. So you are literally able to see the entire life, life stage of a particular order. So if I enter an order on my side, I actually send it to the CME. So CME replies back saying, hey, I've actually received your particular, you know, particular order, let's say to buy at some limit, whatever. And then I wait. And then once that order is filled, so the CME gives me back a tag along with the fill price of the actual order that I know I, that I, know I got. Filled. So this is the closest, the closest that you can get to what is really happening in the market at a very granular level, right? So just to give you, an, give you an idea of the volume of data we're talking about, it is absolutely ridiculous, right? You have about 100 million messages a day, out of which maybe 14 to 18 or 20, 20 million are just updates on the book. And when, I, when I say the book, I'm actually talking about the entire limit order book that you see in an MBO data feed, out of which just 1.3 million are like trades. So if you sort of think about that, that's a... That's like more than one, one is to 10 ratio of trades to book updates, right? And one of the things you will likely notice in this MBO feed is you have an incredible amount of can cancels. And if you know what first in first out markets are, and if you know uh, the structure of the limit order book where there's a time prior, there's a time priority. And like all of this is spelled out guys in, in the educational stuff that Bookmap that Bookmap has actually put out, and it's first class stuff. So you should really take some time off. Forget forget about the actual markets, about trading right 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 now. Really spend some time on the education material, on the education material 
that all of the people in the bookmap team have actually put out its first class stuff, right? So one of the things you should actually think about is this concept of 18 to 20 million book updates a day and just 1.3 million are trades, but the book updates are filled with a lot of cancels, right? What could, what kind of strategy do you think the high frequency guys are doing or the large hedge fund guys that are doing this rapid kind of trading? Why are there so many cancels? So before the end of the talk, I would love to hear what some of your answers might be to that. You know, so while while we're actually going through the uh, talk, you should actually think about that. What a strategic reason should be as to why there are so many cancels, right? Okay, Bruce, next next slide, please. Okay, so book bookmap is basically taking this massive amount of data from the MBO feed, right? And they're rounding up in you know in a way that it makes sense to humans to through visual processing, right? Which which is absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. I've been I've been a big fan of it for a very long time myself. Um, so, if you have a notion of market structure, context, um, as well as this super critical background knowledge about the life cycle of a particular a particular order the rules of the limit of the way the limit order of books should behave and so on and so forth, you will li literally be able to one of to do one of many different things. You'll be able to sort of detect in some qualitative way, some sort of market sentiment, sentiment shift. You'll be able to identify price, you know, level, spot, fake, you know, order it where like people are trying to, you know, place, place an order, cancel, place an order, can, you know, cancel it and so on. And Hopefully, you would have made a very op optimal trading decision, and then you can, you know, gain whatever profits you have. Right. So, within the actual MBO ecos ecosystem, I actually call it, or the or the actual MBO land landscape, there are so many different kinds of of info that you can glean. Um, uh, some of it, you can take the raw MBO feed. You can actually create your own proprietary fact factor for which, for which, of course, you need to know Java program programming. If you're still living, if you actually want to do it within the bookmap ecosystem, you'd have to write your own jar, or you can go and hire, you know, somebody to do it, or whatnot, right? But next, next slide. So within the MBO MBO ecosystem, as I said, there are so many different things going on, and one of the most famous thing that everybody knows is a stop run, right? When humans kind of think about a stop, stop run, what you typically see is you would all of a sudden no, notice that price is going towards some, some particular level. You see some short term vol, and then all of a sudden you, you see price over, you know, shooting. And then you see a lot of fills really, really fast. And then you know that people are fortunately liquidating stuff and then you and then you kind of and it's all happening really really fast right just to give you and give you an idea um i've actually looked at a lot of stop run data um the first stop run detector i built was in 2019 or 2018 i forget the longest stop run that i had seen back back then was something in the range of 850 900 nanoseconds, something like that, right? It's so this is happening so fast that it's kind of hard for the for the human brain to sort of wrap wrap its arms around, right? So the things that come together for a stop run to actually happen are market li li uh, market liquidity. There's forced losses that people are actually taking. And there's a preponderance of market order to sell. Fill me at market, get me out of this damn trade kind of thing, right? That's what makes a stop run. Now, most, most of us, next, next slide, Bruce, please. Mo most of us, when we think of a stop, stop run, we're only sort of thinking about, oh, uh, there were 
50 lots that got stopped, stopped out, or 200 lots that got stopped out, so on and so forth. But, it, but if you're really able to look into the nitty gritty of that NBO data feed, you can really know how many participants were in that stop, stop run, right? So you have these metadata tags, these NBO tags, and a lot of the actual info about all of those NBO data sets, apart from the fact that you're just looking at some quantity of sorts, a lot of the real, real info is sitting in those metadata tags. So once you can take those metadata tags, you can actually create your own me measurements of things. So now all of a sudden, a stop, stop run is a lot, lot more than just the amount of quantity that got traded. And that's a very critical part, right? You actually literally want to know, if you actually think of markets in a slightly different con construct, and what I mean is this, if you think of, let's say, markets as passive buyers, uh, 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 passive people, aggressive, you know, people, right? Passive buyers or passive sellers or aggressive buyers or aggressive sellers that are selling some amount of trading volume, let's say, right? That are transacting some traded volume. But apart from that, what you also really want to know is how many people or how many tags, how many, how many tags got tagged on to some trade. So what I sort of mean, mean by that is this. If I have, let's say, 500 lots on the on the S&P 500 that got tra traded and I had 500 buy aggressive buy tags, right? Simple, simple case. That makes me know, I can know from that info that these 500 lots, 501 lots traded those 500 lots. So they're, they're essentially the crowd that's actually trading, right? If you use, you could use tags as a proxy for people, but you truly don't know whether many of those trades came from a single player. And we will actually get to it. That's, that's the way large players sometimes trade. They slice and dice their stuff, you know, giving in one lot trades and, and basically doing iceberg trading and so on and so forth. But if I had the same 500 lots and I just saw two tags, right, I can then kind of know, okay, there's some big players that are involved here you know, that, that bought more than what a retail trader would, would do, right? So that, so those are some of the key sort of insights that you, that you can have with MBO data that goes into the dy dynamics of what mo uh, modern markets are driven by, right? It's a key thing, it's a key thing to remember. I still urge, urge you after, after this talk, so this weekend, spend, spend, spend some time uh, go through the fundamentals again and again and again until this all becomes kind of full. And what I mean by that is this, uh, Bruce, could you flip these? Um, what I mean by that is this, whenever you see a sell stock stop run on your screen, right? You should be thinking, what is in that like text, right? Whenever you see a buy stop run on your screen, you should be thinking, what is in that text, right? Once you actually do that, then, then you can you can actually place that MBO ev event within the structural context of what is going on in financial markets, right? Uh, you can you can use all of the actual context stuff that Tom B talks about on on, on his you know webinars, which is absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, uh, it may it may it may sound you know rep repetitive, but it's almost like it's muscle memory in a way, right? Uh, and as humans, this is the only way that we can really truly inter interact with all of the nuances going on in MBO data. We certainly cannot react in, in you know, milliseconds or microseconds or whatever, but we can react in a slightly modif modified way, transferring whatever domain knowledge we have about MBO data into uh, human ex executed trades and bookmap is a fantastic bridge that we have that kind of does that, right? So let's actually go a uh, step back a second. Bruce, can you just flip please again? No, it's the, it's the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So let's just sort of step back here for a second. You must be thinking, oh man, all of these guys are using all these 
really, really complex machine, you know, learning method, methods and AI, so on and so forth. Um, look, I, I, I've, been, I've been like a, a continuous part of this field since 92. And I have to tell you, it's not magic, right? It may seem like magic, but it's not. Um, the, the, the overall takeaway is this, right? Way back um, when we just had a C CPU, um, you would, if you wanted to build some kind of market trading system, you would have an X, meaning that I can notice a bunch of things about some stock or you know asset. And I think that this set of inputs I have is related to a future return in some sort of a way. So, which is what that f of x x x is, right? You would actually pass whatever inputs inputs you had into some math into some mathematical formula that you believe will tell you something about the future, and that gave you your for, forecast, which is this y, right? That is what. Uh, uh, the chairman of NVIDIA, Jensen Wang, called software version 1.0, right? So somewhere around 2012-ish, when a lot of data scientists kind of realized, hey, we could actually use these GPUs that were being played by a lot of the video gamers to do to train artificial neur neural nets, things started to really snow snowball, right? So the, con so the concept there is, I actually believe that these set of things are sort of impo important for the X, that's my X. These sort of fa factors are sort of critical or I build features of something. And then I say, I, this is the actual out output that I've noticed in the past, right? And you basically, and you basically feed it through a machine you know, learning model and it, and it actually gives you back a, fun a function. So now, now you notice something new, you basically pass it back to the function and it actually tells you, okay, this is what the output is, right? We've gone from that, from a single GPU to multiple GPUs sitting in multiple rooms. Uh, here today, you know, we have these guys where we could say, I actually notice X, I, know, I notice a Y, I run it through a GPU. So the GPU trains, the artificial neural network trains, and it basically gives you some fun function that maps input to out output. Now you can actually cascade, cascade this across many, many GPUs and essentially get a better Y, right? So this is software version 2.2.0, right? But it's still super difficult to teach a machine about market con context, right? It's very difficult, but we are actually getting, getting there. So, and I actually bring this up especially because at least in the very recent past if you're if, if you're on facebook or other social media you might see oh we, we have ai discovering trades and all these ridiculous returns it's usually bs right um these are still uh, uh mechanical in nature though there's a random compo component involved that we then call generative ai right so it is actually getting hard to actually compete, but the actual key thing is there are things that humans can still do better than any AI can, better than any GPT can, right? Uh, if you have a pen and a piece of paper, you should really look up, there's a test called the ARC test, A-R-C test for, uh, you, you, can, you can actually look it up. Um, there are things that machines cannot do today that a five-year-old human kid can do. Right, so we're we still have hope, and Bookmap is certainly building that bridge to give us hope. Right, so now I come to the last slide um, where we can talk about tricks that people might use that I've used in the past trading large sizes. Right, um, first and like foremost is when you're actually given a book. You know, let's say, let's say, let's say that you're actually given like uh, uh, five hundred million dollars to one, right? So the actual point is, you need to have some no notion of overall risk, you know, control in the actual portfolio you have, right? So you're obviously not going to go buy, you know, you're not going to go and put like seventy percent of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, right? 
so whenever you have a large size book, you have to transact a large amount to get that position on. You know, and may, maybe your risk, you know, controls call for hey, not you know more than two percent into any single particular asset. But you still need to be able to get into that trade. That is that two percent. So the question is, how do you do it in such a way that nobody else knows that you're doing it? But after you're done, you make sure to do things where that other people know notice so that they can write on your coattails. So, so they're they're helping you push the actual price up or down or whatever the case may be. Right? So back in the past, one of the things that we had to do at Synapse, that, that was the old group I founded at at SAC Capital, right? Um, on the New York stock stock exchange, they used to have a, a system called ready it's it's basically it's, it was called the ready dot system which was designated order turn general so so whenever a trade was sent on an electronic basis to the new york stock stock exchange you would get a dot id back right so one of the things that we did was we had our banks of machines and then we asked the new york stock stock exchange to allocate to us 50 or 45 different dot ids and we would randomly choose three or four, four of them to route our orders through it. So nobody could really track saying, hey, this order is coming from this particular dot or dot ID. Nobody would really know that. But by the time we actually started getting into our, into our positions, then you could actually bang in a single dot ID to kind of adv advertise to the world, hey, there's some big player that's actually buying, buying it. That's one way in which you could um, stay, you know, unknown, remain anonymous, so to speak, and accumulate a lot of stock or sell a lot of stock. Uh, around, I think, like 94, 95-ish, you know, whatever, we, we started getting these VWAP engines, which you guys are still looking at today, right? Um, and the sole goal there was, that was more of a tool that I think was made by brokers to show that they could execute your trades well, right? Uh, and then, and then they said, "Hey, we will actually beat your beat your VWAP, and then brokers would get paid based on how much they beat the VWAP by, and so on. So they would all, they would all get judged. That kind of still happens today, but it's I think it's really like a naive trading strategy. Though I think that the uh, retail world sort of embraced it, and actually thinking that, hey, this is like magic." stuff you know it actually goes to view up and fails goes to view up and fails right that's not always the case okay uh that is actually one way of sort of doing it the other way is if you're trying to accumulate a lot of stock and you have a large book and you're and you're holding things for a long time you know you could you could actually go and tell your broker hey so i have like a million and a half shares to buy of something there's weakness in the stock so I only want to get filled on a down tick. Every down tick, I want to get filled. So what that literally means is you're you're always saying you're you're like only showing a part of the actual order you want to do, right? But you're only getting filled on a down tick. So which means I can avail of re rebates as a liquidity provi provider. Why? Because I'm sitting on the passive side of the book, right? So a lot of the bigger bigger players you will you will see. That they're first on the, they are actually usually on the passive side of the side side of the book, and then when the time is right, they actually turn turn around and they do this aggressive trading, right? Even though I believe that a large percentage of trades today on the CME are from the aggressive aggressive side, and that's a uh, you know the uh, uh, high you know free the high frequency guys playing their you know games, and there's so many games would probably take many many hours to go through some of them, but I just actually want to be able to give you just a general kind of view, like a 25,000 feet view. Um, now, one of the actual things that sort of happens is when you're running a large book, right? The risk allocations you have, which says, this is the maximum position I'm going to take. And this is true even as an individual trader, because I think I saw somebody, I think on some feed yes, yesterday that said, oh, uh, this is the last trade of the day and I'm going to risk my entire day's earnings on this one trade, 
right? That may not necessarily be a good idea, right? There's an old saying, saying that goes, there are old traders, there are bold traders, but there are no old, bold traders, right? It is good to be bold, but, but you need to know when, right? And you just can't think of, okay, I'm just going to risk my entire trading day on this one like, trade. It's not necessarily a good thing to do, right? So if you don't take care of how much you're going to allocate to a trade, if you don't take care of your risk, risk will take you out of the game. It's a guarantee. I can guarantee you this. Um, in fact, I would like to tell you um, some wounds that I personally had. I was, I think, uh, 24. Um, uh, I'd just come to the SAC main, main desk. Steve you know, Cohen used to sit behind me, right behind me, and I had my bank of like machine that was putting out trade ideas. I would tell some of them, and then I would trade some of them there. So at this time, I think I bought 130 odd thousand shares of Cat Caterpillar. Caterpillar was at like 60, 70, something like that. And the next morning, they came out with a very negative report. The stock was down 13 handles, right? So for me, as a 24 year old guy, it's like it's like a devastating thing, right? You basically come in the come in the act morning and you see like, oh, oh my God, I'm I'm like down seven figures on this one stock and that's going to dictate your entire day basically right um did i take too big of a position yes i did and i paid you know for it right so again i i just stressed this risk control stuff risk control risk control risk control it's the first thing you need to do it's the last thing you need to do and that will sustain you to be able to play this game for a very long long time right um, I will also tell you some other war stories I've had um, around September 11th, the, just before September, in the September, yeah, 2011. Um, our book size was about 740, 750 something million. You know, like August, September, are usually like sort of muted, you know, markets. So it was like much, much lesser. Uh, and then September 11th actually happened, and my friend and, and, and my my like assistant trader and now my friend, really good friend Dennis, called me in my home. I was not at work on that day, and he said, "Hey, there's a small plane that hit the World Trade Center." You know, I just brushed it off like anybody else. I used to live in Upper Upper East Side in like New York City, and then after 15 minutes, he calls me up again. He says, "Al, I think you better come and come and work. Serious stuff going on." I did not have a TV TV at home. I just moved into a new home. Uh, so I basically walked it, walked into like work. They stopped markets, and then of course our our trading system had never seen anything of the sort, and it literally wanted to buy everything in the world. It wanted to buy every everything, the insurance stock, airline stocks, every single thing it wanted to buy. Right. Anyway, we just sort of let it loose, uh, and once the actual markets op open. We kept on losing four million a day, five million a day, six year million, like clockwork. We were losing money, right? Because it was long the entire world. And then, of course, we're actually banging on the systems. And I still remember the president of New York Stock Exchange called up the powers that be at my old shop, SAC Capital. They say, "Hey, you need to actually tell these quant guys to sort of tone down the trading because we want everyone in the world to have equal, you know, access." Right? By which time, our book had grown to about one point three billion. We were still losing money every single day, five to seven million by clock, clockwork. That month of September, I think we lost about 30 odd million for the month. And then we were forced to cut down the, the size of our book back down to 500 million or lesser. I had to basically relent. I had to sell stuff at a loss, we took the loss. And then in the following month, we made up about 34 million. Now, had we, had we just followed our system, Right? Had we followed the process, and following the process is very, very critical, right? When you sort of trade, had we followed the process, we could have literally made about 140 odd million dollars on the following month, but we just made 30 odd million because we were forced to cut down capital. And I actually bring this thing process into the whole book map ecosystem again, right? The way that you can ideally leverage this fantastic tool is one know what the 
uh, domain knowledge is get domain knowledge about the data feed that this tool is uh, displaying in so nice a way. Then think about structure, think about con context. And someone like Tom B can tell you tons about that. He's you know been around the block for a very long time. And then you have, and then you basically create a process that psychologically agrees with you to be able to place a trade. Right, that's the key thing. So now I think we should probably move to book, book map and I'm open to any sort of questions, comments, what I'm sort of looking for, what I'm seeing, whatnot, right? So how would we get the uh, questions, Bruce? Uh, yeah, so uh, I have a few questions and then uh, everybody, uh, uh, please just put your questions into the um, chat room uh, there in the uh, in stage uh, in, in Discord. Uh, that's the way to go. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'm, I'm, yeah, great, great presentation, uh, very unique. Uh, no one has uh, covered uh, these things uh, like, like you did here. I'm, I'm wondering, um, I guess, it, you know, your strategies are so are going to be, there's going to be many different strategies that you're trading. Uh, but how, how would you determine fair value? Uh, I'm, I'm sure the answer is probably, there, there was probably dozens of determinations of, of fair value. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm just kind of curious um, what your answer would be. So the no, so the notion that you might have of fair value is very intrinsically linked to what you think a distortion is, right? And how you're sort of measuring that uh, distortion, right? So one super simple exact example of this would be. And I and I'm and I'm actually simplifying it a lot, right? So let's say that I have some system I've actually created that looks only at stop stop runs, for instance, right? So a stop so a stop run. If you think about a stop run, it has multiple multiple things. One is there's a certain number of contracts that are traded in the stop 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 run. They are passive buyers or sellers. They're aggressive buyers. There's a time that the stop run lasts, lasts them, right? So if I take these four things and I create some kind of measure, now know where on where on you know uh, this distribution, so to speak, off stop run, particular stop run that I'm looking at lies in, right? So if if it is a super unique sort of stop stop run where the number number is large, the uh, you know aggressive passive participants that sort of ratio. So let's say something like uh, aggressive buy tags divided by aggressive buy tags plus aggressive sell tags. I want a number to be really small right? because then I know that there's one large right. I want that number to be super super small to know that this is very very unique. The more unique. The more smaller, the more smaller it is, the more meaningful it is. So I can take that info from NBO data sets, which using Bookmap, right? And I can place that into a more subjective um, uh, stru structure and I call a context, which I've created as a human, right? So the more far away it is, the more farther away from some semblance of fair value that I'm getting. Does that answer your question, Bruce? Or um, yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, using stop runs, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, how long would a trade determine this kind of fair value with a stop run? How how long would it last you? Like, would it be like microseconds, nanoseconds? Um, no, no, no. no, it's not. It's not like. Uh, not at all. It could it could it could last you know minutes to you know hours. And all I could give you, um, there was one. Gosh, I could forget. I think sometime in in twenty I'm trying to think like twenty eight eighteen when I just started using book the book map and I was watching this 
with this other trader friend of mine, phenomenal trader, Jonathan Strud is his, is his name. Uh, I was watching this with him because he was the one that introduced me to Bookmap. Uh, there was a single trade of 2,884 lots. I, I kid you not, this number is fused in my head. I promise you, if you go back, and I will try and actually find out right, when this actually happened, it was this one large trade that kind of essentially was the low of that cycle. And you could so easily see that this was a really a forced liquidation of shorts. There was some big player that basically bought all of that, you know, passive buy. Bought all of, all of that stuff. And then you could see there are other big players that are trying to buy the asset. And then pushing, pushing the price. Up. Right? So one thing you could see is you know, like um, 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 back in the day, one of the one of the things is that it, that if you actually typically went through the you know channels of of uh, technical anal analysis, I mean, I certainly don't use it, um, but if you did, you would say, hey, here's here's you know su support and here's resistance, right? If you think of what really support really means, support is not a price. It's not a price. Okay. Support is some, some activity of sorts that you expect to be shown again, right? So an example of this is this. So if you, if you, had, if you had a price, let's say at 5,400 on the ES, and we, and we kept going there and it rallied, kept going there and it sort of rallied, right? It's not the price. It's the state of the actual auction that the major part, major part of the people that are involved in this are looking at that price and they think, hey, this is a good buy. So they so they put liquidity there, right? So as what is actually happening happening now? This was this was probably a big stop stopper, right? Yep. Yeah. Right. So you can, and, and and a lot of absorption earlier yeah, with, the, with right. an iceberg. You're not trading price. You're not trading price. That's a very critical thing, right? Price is definitely giving you your net PNL for the day. You're not trading price. You're trading a process, process and you're trying to see how pe people are, other people, and ho hopefully larger people are trying to process the limit order book, right? How do they sort of do it? by being passive buyers here, by uh, forcing losses of smaller you know, players, where somebody says, hey, get me, get me the hell out. I just want to leave. I just want to, I just want to stop this game, right? And so you're essentially, you're essentially taking part in an auction. In fact, my uh, old co colleague, you know, uh, John, Jonathan Struth made one of the most astute ob observations I've ever heard, right? He did this thing where he took the bookmap screen and he turned off the price. So just turn off the price. Can you just do that, Bruce? Can you just turn off the price? Turn it off. Yeah. Okay, now, now just zoom out, please. If you would, right. No, but, there, but there's still a price there, right? If you turn off the price, guys, Right? I promise you, you can trade the markets in a much better way. I kid you not. All, all you're really doing is you're focusing then on what other people are doing. You're focusing on the book. And the book has a lot of info, a lot of info that you can glean. Right? Super simple thing. So now you don't have a price. Okay? You don't have any past notion, notion, notion of stuff. But then when you look at the screen and you're looking at all of this fast bread, breadcrumbs left by all these, you know, in this case, a stop, you know, one, you can actually literally see uh, where people are showing interest. What did they sort of do? Like, sure, you can actually see like a semblance of price with this black thing, but you really don't need price to trade. And I, and I like to tell you, like, I mean, this guy chances uh, performance is completely nuts. It's absolutely crazy, right? Um, 
I think apart from, I mean, the best trader that I've, that I've ever sat near and sat in behind, certainly my original mentor was Steve, you know, Cohen. And the uh, second guy I know is Kirk, because uh, he, he runs out of, out of California. And probably the third guy is definitely Chance Poole. Jonathan's true, yeah. So he he you know showed me this probably like two years ago. I'm like I didn't I not think of it this way. And then you kind of sit back. What is actually going on is this, right? Price or like a a, a transaction at a particular price is changing li changing liquidity. That change in uh, li liquidity is then changing the behavior of future prices. And so that process keeps on going in a loop. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, I mean, uh, here, you know, you, you've just taken off um, uh, kind of, uh, well, not only the, the, the actual price or historic price, historical price here, but uh, you've also taken off the volume. But now we're just looking at the order book and icebergs and stops. So here is actually uh, something really crazy, right? You see, you see that like li li this liquidity band on the lower side, right by where the view offline is, I think, right? And then you sort of look at look at that, and then you look at the SV, SVP, the session volume profile. See that low, you know, volume node there, right? What is that low volume node actually telling you when you're looking at this bank of you know liquidity coming in, but that low but that low volume node? And I ask, so is this for this entire screen? Yeah, right, right. So it's actually basically telling you that look, I mean that that part was people really do not want to even transact transact there. So whoever whoever did a transaction there, they hit like a local minima or you know maximum. Right. So, and this is actually what I mean by this context, which I, which I think Tom talks about a lot on his, on his, uh, you know, ch channel. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, any other questions in here? They're starting to come in. Um, Let's see, uh, Perfect Pair is talking about, so uh, it would be a system that determines what a stop run at fair value is, so more unique the output of a system is further, uh, the further you are uh, from that fair value. Not, okay, so I don't, I don't really under, understand the question, but I'll, I'm, thinking of what what this question is um, so if if you're if you're at least if you're actually measuring let's say a stop one you know using more than a single variables by single variable I mean like the amount of like quantity trick data um, let's say let's say we we actually came up with a simple with like a slightly more involved measure that says something called trade inten intens intensity, right? So you take the beginning of the stop of the stop run and the end of the stop, stop run, and you basically divide it by the time that the stop run lasted. That's trade intensity, because now you're saying in so short, in so short a time, so, so much, so much uh, stock or, you know, number of like contract traded. So if you did that, you have a, slightly better way of thinking or measuring what a stop run is, right? Now, if you took all of those, all of this particular me measurement, let's say all, over the last 10, 10 days, right? You have so many things that you, that you actually observe, but the, the event that you're looking at now, right? Remember, you're not trading price, you're trading an event, always an event, always an event. So if you can look at the actual event that you have now and you place it within the context of where the event lies of the same kind of event that you've observed over the last decade, you're going to have thousands of these events. So the event that you have now, you have to take that 
and you know you have to sort of look at look at within the actual uh, dis distribution of like events you have this particular event on Sundays where does this event lie is it in the tails is it an average event or so on and so on right so ob obviously you want to be able to trade events that are completely mean meaningful and the me the meaning is very spe special in financial markets when you consider that a particular event is in the tails. The tails are very, very critical. In fact, there's a whole uh, mathematical field called extremal value theory that does exactly this, EDT, right? Which are looking at very rare but very critical events. And these rare and critical events can change entire distributions. For, ex for example, um, 1987, the crash of 1987 changed the one-day return distributions of the S&P forever, right? Most systems would not do well having that one particular event. So trying to put stuff under, under the rug, a lot of data scientists conveniently ignore that particular event because that's going to screw up, screw up all of their normal statistics. Does that answer your question of sorts in a way? I think so, uh, more probably than uh, than we wanted. Um, <laughs> but no, no, it was it was excellent. Yeah, he says yeah, it clarifies. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Um, what would actually help, right, guys? When you're when you're actually looking at when you're actually reading through all of the actual book map, the uh, resources that Bookmap has. Um, if this is complex data. It really is, right? Um, once you actually get the domain knowledge, you need to sort of think about what we could do to turn that data into information from which you can infer some infer something. Right? So you need to think about how you might be able to kind of do that. For instance, the company I have now does kind of that, but in a sort of a different way. But I'm not going to talk about it very, very much here. Okay. Um, let's see. Alois is asking, um, uh, what are your thoughts of these uh, ES uh, algo bands um, that uh, you see in the market? They've been in there for a while. And, you know, we've seen them over the years, but uh, they've been very prominent over the last several months. Uh, here, Al, these are what I'm talking about. Yeah, so typically, you know, so this kind of goes back to that question that I had for everybody, remember? Uh, why are there so many uh, editions, deletions from the book? Have you guys thought about that in general at some level? Why would you see a lot of editions, deletions, editions, deletions? Any answers? I'm sorry, pose the question again, Al. The question was this, right? Uh, before I actually answer, answer that, the, uh, the actual answer lies in this, this, in this like, notion of why are there so many additions and deletions in the book of trades? Why is that? Does anyone want to attempt? What are, what are they trying to achieve? What are they trying to achieve even with these like bands? Think about this, right? This is like, this is real domain knowledge. Uh, well, the string of answers coming through. Um, so uh, because it's FIFO execution, uh, they want to be first in the book. Uh, that's what JMK is talking about. Uh, hide their intentions uh, uh, to attract price or get the best price, uh, influence direction, uh, spreading, uh, hedging, um, elasticity, pressure, um, first in queue, Try trying to manipulate price toward their larger orders, volatility control, uh, dis disrupting uh, indicators to make the system lag. Got it. Okay. So I'll, so I'll, like, so I'll like to tell you, and so this kind of takes us back to about 2000, 2008 to about 2012-ish or so. Where there was there was there was this thing called spoofing going on, right? And the actual original idea of spoofing is when two one, you know, machines fight, was if I gave your algo 
this noise, this massive amount of noise, right? Putting it through, canceling it, putting it through, canceling it. And if your algo was not smart enough to know that was noise, your machine would spend more time potentially trying to clean up, clean up that noise. You had a little bit of edge because of that. But one of the things that sort of happens is if I were, if I were a high frequency trader, let's say, and I placed, placed an order to buy something at 5,000. And with this MBO, MBO data feed, I can actually literally know how many people are ahead. Right? So let's say that I place my particular, my particular order at some price, let's say 5,000, then I sit and wait. I actually then notice that people that are in front of me at the same price are getting filled. But there's, there are not very many people after me in the book. So question, what have I learned, learned from that, right? I basically learned that I have no, if I got filled and the rate at which those fields are going on, the guys behind me are not going to be able to hold up the price. So, so I know that it's going to tick down next, right? So, so it's almost like a sort of a game, you know, theoretic kind of, approach to this thing, right? So one of the actual reasons why you may see those, see those bands, I'm guessing here, uh, I don't think anyone can say for like certain, they may, they may be, be potentially triggering off some, you know, option uh, expo exposure of sorts, or, you know, somebody may want to buy and sell it. So they just put it out there. So if they get filled, they get filled. But if you sort of go there and you see things being can canceled, then you actually want to re rethink why those bands may be. And there is no way, at least for myself, to certainly know why those band, bands are, but I've been seeing them very long, long, very long time. Okay. It's like potentially a way of, of gathering info by preserving their place or place in the queue, as you know, some of your viewers said. Okay. Um, well, Alois is asking, uh, like, they, they never get filled. Uh, and Al, as I kind of understood it, um, uh, these queuing algos, or stacker algos, uh, they they do at certain points stay in the order book and get filled, uh, kind of like in here in this zone. Uh, and, uh, you know, they kind of stop you know, some of that activity. Uh, but uh, uh, on the other hand, though, I, I agree with Al Luis. I mean, you can see consistently as well they, that they are just, you know. So they may, they may also have these local forecast systems. And what I mean by local forecast system is some short-term forecast of sorts, I mean, especially if this, this market moving sideways, right? So under certain uh, uh, circumstances in the book and – you know, maybe, maybe when the book is relatively light, there may be some forecasting system that are able to say, okay, you know what, I think that this is fair value. I, when it sort of goes lower and it goes to the middle, I'll see so if, it, if it actually goes up and I'll set it short. There may, there may be systems that are, that are picking up those sort of dynamics too, right? So by pl placing these trades on like either side of the current transac transaction price, I'm sort of a short of, of like getting filled and I can do these short -term. You know, like me, you know, reverse. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so when you're talking about these kind of systems, you must have remembered it's not a single si signal. It's like a portfolio of signal, right? Because, rem because many, many of these si signals are sort of reacting to events. Right. So uh, stop run event, like what we're going to talk about, right? So we would have a, a, a detector of sorts, and then based on what we sort of detect and we rank where things are, and then based on where things are, we may kind of do like a small trade of that particular system, that particular sig signal. Like that, you may, you may have a whole bunch of signals that are working together, super simple signals. And this is like the thumbprint typically of high frequency trading systems where the construct of the signal is not complex. That could be very simple. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. makes sense. Um, let's see here. Um, Al, I, I was kind of wondering about, um, like, uh, over the week, uh, we've, a lot of the traders, that uh, institutional traders were talking about very, uh, very precise uh, entries uh, and being very, very careful uh, and um, strategic about their entries. Uh, but when it came to exiting, it was a different story. Uh, it was more like, you know, it's going, it's going sideways, we want out. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, I'm wondering how you look at, at that uh, in the context of your trading. You know, but most of, most of the so the chunk of my of the trading I've done has all been in, in like an institutional setting. So, and institutions might not necessarily look at that in that uh, sort of a with like with like a sort of like a really hard hard cut way, right? Because these are these are systems that follow some process, but of course, as like a retail trader. You could say, hey, if I actually bought this, uh, if it's not going my, my way, I'm just going to blow it out kind of thing. Oh, I'm just moving sideways. There's no, you know, action. You know. Like now, right, right now, when you're actually looking at your screen, right? So all I'm seeing is, for the most part, some kind of local mean, you know, reversion by behavior. So the only kind of event that I might have, I might react to in, like, this case, if I say, you know, like looking at the right side of the screen, I would, if I think that the mean reversion is going to continue, and there are certainly mathematical methods which you can use to measure the amount of, of trendiness or mean reversion beha behavior. Uh, there's this thing called the Hearst component which kind of measures trendiness or mean uh, reversionary behavior of a time series. Right, so the thing, the things like that you could use to say, okay, now I don't, I think mean reversion is going to continue. It's moved to the lower band, and I see that there's less uh, transactions going on here. So this has been like a, a point that people reject, reject it, and I think it's going to go towards the mean. You may actually buy it, right? But so I could decide that as like as like a human, you can't just look at the look at the price and this side, right? You need you need to look at, or you need to think about how the book is shaped is actually shaping up. If you buy at that edge, right, and you immediately see that there are a lot of answers in the book, you better blow out of that damn position. Yeah, this is this is something really great. Uh, a, a lot of traders, uh, I think, from at least from the retail side. Uh, uh, have less knowledge and understanding of the order book uh, and its context. Uh, and then w when I'm speaking to uh, institutional traders uh, or, you know, uh, prop traders, whatever, even floor traders, uh, they're, they're always talking about order book. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe even in the pit, I mean, they're talking about the exchange, the interest, in, you know, and, and kind of gauging that. And that's what you do see in the order book. Uh, so, uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I there pose. Are only, there are basically only two books you need, you really need to trade, right? The first book you need to read is Reminiscences of a Stock op Operator by Edwin Lefebvre. To this day, I've, I've probably read it 35 times. I've been about 35, 36 years in financial markets. I read it religiously every year at least once. That's the first book you need, you need to read. The second book you need to learn to read is the order book. All right, there it is. That's a, that's a good sound bite right there. It really is. <laughs> critical. Like I'm sitting and watching this stuff now, and you can actually see some, you know, the, uh, the there are some orders that are being pulled. You see? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And now you start to wonder, hey, where did where did all those other guys go with the, with those hands? Are they still there, Bruce? Is that bandit behavior still there? Ah, uh, well, I'm I'm looking at the Trader Map Lite version where oh, we filtered yeah. it. You know, we Got filtered it, it out. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, it, oh, yeah, it's still in there uh, for sure. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, if we've been going for about an hour and fifteen, uh, let's see if there's any more questions in here. Uh, just a moment. Uh, quite quite a few questions actually. Uh, CMJ is asking for a copy of the slides, uh, so uh, I don't know if that's going to something that uh, you want to, uh, to offer, uh, Al. That's okay. That's fine. Okay. okay. Uh, and then uh, let's see. Yeah, reminiscence of a stock operator is a classic. Uh, and uh, let's see here. There's all these answers to your question earlier, Al. So one like crazy sto story that I want to tell you is that when I was in co college, right? Um, you know, I actually borrowed money out of my credit card. So like, don't do that. Terrible idea. That definitely don't do. Um, I think rates then were like 17% or 18 something percent. So first time, first time around, I actually borrowed stuff, I think like, 14,000 or something from a whole bunch of small cards I had. And then sort of started trading op options, you know, built it up to about 114, 115,000 in seven months. Then I did one big trade. I think it was like uh, sh shorting TMX, which is uh, tel Telefonos de Mexico, because that was the time of all the NAFTA stuff going on with Bill Clinton. Oh my God, that, that hurt. So I, so I went from being the biggest g genius on like Monday, on like Wednesday, I was like, oh my God, I just I didn't want to kill myself. Cool. I went to the greatest school on the planet, like within 48 hours. So <laughs> you, are, you are only as good as your last, as your last trade, right? Mm -hmm. Because these yeah. are what they call, you know what scientists call like weak, weak theory domains, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not really predicting stuff. You can... You can forecast things, right? Uh, you can actually predict how water is going to mix with H2, or, 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 or H2 is going to mix with O to form wa water. Yeah. Uh, in H2O, in that exact proportion, always. But you, but, but you can't, you can't, you cannot predict the markets. It's been forecast. The markets will be wide error in a bar. So like everything is like, like probabilistic in a way, right? So what do you what do you what do you see now in this in this in this thing going on? For instance, right? So price is still staying at that lower you know level. Right? We saw in the past. If you see, there was uh, sufficient buying, I think, before uh, under under that we walk, right? So now for things to sort of hold, what do you need to see? You need to see more. Let's see. You need you need to see see more ads on the big side of the book. You need to see more can cancels on the S side on the S side of the book. So that's supposed to be things. You can actually come up with your own measurements of you can take, let's say, can you know levels on the mid side, ten levels on the S S side of the book, some of the uh, you know ads on the bid sides, some of the some of the Cap cancels on like the ask and find like a ratio between between them and see what actually happens. You know, so simple simple stuff like that. It's not complex at all. It's not. Yeah, yeah. no, it's great great stuff, Al. I mean, uh, uh, that 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 kind of context and like you said early uh, in the webinar, uh, you know, th this is an auction and that's what. That is exactly, these are the participants in the auction, and they're telling you uh, what they think of it uh, at, at this time uh, by pulling or adding. So when our, when, our, when our tool is ready, we actually certainly hope to be on the bookmap eco you know, systems, and this tool will tell you in plain, in plain English, you know, what all this is. I can tell them that's, that's, our, that's our goal, to take complex data and that simple. And we certainly yeah. hope you will you'll be on your platform. Yeah, yeah, it sounds sounds great, Al. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, some really really great stuff. Uh, and let me see if there's any last minute questions in here. Uh, 
Hey, just a second here. Uh, what's your read, if any, uh, about large transactions that happen uh, on the close or just after? How is it possible uh, that they don't sweep the order book, and how is it, or and is it possible to infer something from those? I mean, those are actually usually crosses, right? Uh, on the CME, CME. You know, the the uh, tran transactions I believe can be put on the actual order unit book, but there may be some end of end of day uh, set settling, so to speak. People might have sort of like derivative contracts written out to act that maybe set settle at the very end end of the day. Things like things like that. You know, uh, look the the the, the mark so the market structure is continuously change changing. Uh, it's it's really really difficult to keep because nobody really knows what kind of derivative con you know, contract because these may be private derivative contracts, right? So there may be things like that that is act that's actually going on where they don't need to necessarily uh, if it's if it's like uh, um, on like stocks, let's say you know you you could have trades on the dark you know pool. So so to be very very honest with you. I, I truly don't understand today, right? I don't have a feeling for the overall structure of the U.S. equity market. I don't, because stocks are trading in so many different venues of sorts. So I don't really completely get what the what the mecha mechanics of the price discovery process is. I don't think it's as simple as some asset is trading at, I say, on one like exchange. I be at another exchange, so let's do it. Those, those studies are long gone, right? Um, but within the actual structure of the equities, uh, of the actual financial markets today, there is a very involved derivative uh, component, so to speak. You can be rest assured that the way the S&P 500 moves is 100% related to some of the option, you know, contracts that are actually out there, for sure, right? Uh, because dealers might have certain levels and, you know, expo exposure, exposure and stuff, right? So that is another thing which you can use for context. So context means, context literally means everything, everything under the, under the sun, you know, kind of thing. Um, it's, not, it's not just me looking at past trades that you've had, Right. If I might be looking at, let's say, crude, crude, crude oil, and by relation the crude oil stocks, I should kind of know what the actual weather is for the drilling stocks in like the Gulf, like the Gulf of Mexico. That is, that's what I mean by kind of context. We're actually bringing in so many different things into the actual to then give you give yourself some. Um, Situational aware, awareness, so to speak, of what is going on. Like once you have that situational aware, awareness, at least like all of the all the people involved in this company that I have, we all sort of believe once you get situational aware, awareness, then your trading job becomes a lot, lot, lot easier because you're able to trade with a lot more comfort. So you can actually pick up from the bookmap ecosystem. There's so many tools that are actually giving you these. The, the valuable piece of info to improve on the situation aware, awareness that you can get from this MBO data, and that in of itself is huge. It's a lot, right? Uh, like here, here, here on the right side of the screen, you know, you can you can kind of see where. So, can you actually show us the full day, Bruce, so, so far? Please. Uh, you mean vertically or horizontally? Uh, what I mean is, if if you can, like, let's say since about nine thirty. If you can, if you can show us all the all the stuff that yeah, yeah, and then can you can you actually make it taller, please? Make it what? Make it what? Stop. Taller. Just expand it. A little bit. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So you can actually literally see this right from like today's today's stuff. Every time that you have a low volume node on the right side. So a low volume node, guys, if you don't know, is some price where not a lot of transactions took place, right? 
something like that. Yeah. So those are kind of low vo low volume nodes. Um, but sure, like these these are not not normalized in like any shape or form for like time because everyone knows that you know the market opens what's been going on what happens. You can actually literally see where most people met to trade, right? That's a notion of fair, of sort of a fair value. And I think within this, someone like, so my friend Tom has this no, notion of my, micro PO, PO, POCs, if you will. These are particular uh, levels within a much smaller time, time frame where people are willing to trade. And then within that, uh, the actual asset pays, pays about from one, you know, low, vol low volume node to the, mid to the middle to another low volume node. And then once the, once the nature of the auction change, changes, then you, you start to get into another rot rotation of sorts. Right? So the... Market as a whole is a particular au auction of sorts, but then within that big au big auction, there are all sorts of the multiple auctions going on. And I think trying to get a feel, you know, for that is is knowing what the uh, some of the actual microstructure uh, dynamics, if you will. Right. I'm not generally talking about market microstructure because to understand or be able to really get involved in market microstructure. You need a very significant mathematical back, background, I assure you of this, right? It's not easily done. It's very difficult, right? Which is actually why firms like Rentec is 200 odd PhDs. It's not for us mere mortals. All right. Uh, let's see. Here that, 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 this, that this option is definitely changing, right? So, it, so if those if those buyers there get filled, and after the, those buyers get like filled, what are they actually go, what are they going to do? What are these passive buyers going to do? Right? Would they become? Would they start to buy at the ask? I don't know. Let's see. It's very very interesting. I mean, this is the first time that I'm watching markets in uh, so many so many months. Well, you can see all the buyers lined up down in the in these areas down here where it's thinly traded. Are there any more questions, guys? No, I th I think that's it, uh, uh, Al. So uh, uh, no, really, really great uh, webinar, Al. Thank you so much. A uh, great perspective, a uh, unique perspective. Uh, we've never really had someone. Uh, as quantitative as you uh, on on a webinar uh, with such vast experience, so uh, uh, really uh, appreciate you coming on and and uh, divulging or uh, opening up uh, some of uh, your knowledge here for for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, guys. And please, please, please spend the weekend, go through the resources that the Bookmap has. They're fantastic stuff, and I really want to say thanks to. Uh, uh, so many, so many people. This would not have been possible without first and foremost members of my team. We all sort of work together to put these slides together, especially Emily. Uh, so I also, also want to thank all of my past mentors. Of course, the actual market, you know, market gods for slapping me around many, many times. For Bruce Sahi for making this actually happen. This is the thing we were talking about six seven years ago, and this finally actually happened. And I hope to speak to you guys soon. And uh, the next time, I hope I can show you what we're sort of building on this front end that will sit alongside the book map and actually help. We will be eagerly awaiting now. Oh, they're getting filled. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting now. So, uh, yeah, and a stop, there's your stop run. And look at the uh, icebergs going off here yeah. uh, as well. So, uh uh, we'll see if this turns into something that you were talking about. So this is like this is probably going to change 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 the auction. It's going to set up for a new rotation probably. Maybe. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks again, Al. And uh, we will uh, catch up another time, hopefully in the near future. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone.
Bye-bye.